I'd like to introduce this extraordinary film of the building of Highbury Little Theatre between 1937 and 1942. Um, the inspiration and, and energy came from John English and his wife Peter English, but it's important to realise this was um, mainly during the period of war when it made it very difficult to work on the building. The work took place during the evenings with the aid of flood rights and at weekends and at one time the theatre got pinched for contravening the blackout regulations and were fined the sum of 40 shillings. I was introduced to the theatre by two close school friends, Geoffrey Goodman and Colin Green. They joined at the beginning of 1942 and they worked on finishing the theatre off prior to its opening in May 1942. Um, my other close school friend, Robin Griffin, and I were persuaded by the other two friends to come to see the first play that was put on, Arms and the Man by George Bernard Shaw. And we turned up one Monday evening and joined the work party and saw the play, I think it was the following week. And we became paid up members by the late summer. So what we're going to see now, Dickie, is your friends from that period that engaged in building the, the theatre, whilst at the same time, of course, they were preparing plays to, yes. to show elsewhere. So on with the film. This film shows us the construction of Highbury Little Theatre during the period 1937 to 1942, and the film was made by Geoffrey Baker. Land was purchased in Sheffield Road, Erdington in 1937 and a disused mission hut already situated on the site was converted into the auditorium and the foyer. The stage, dressing rooms and scene dock have been built throughout in brick. All funds have been raised or subscribed and not one penny has been expended on labour. The work has been carried out mainly during the evenings and weekends. In winter, the work, in winter time the work was continued in the evenings with the aid of floodlights. The entire plans, building and equipment and have been supervised throughout by Mr John English. And here, Dickie, you can see John on the left, am I right? Yes. The site was owned by Miss Anstey, who had property down the road, the old PE college. And this is the old mission hut which I guess had been there for a long time. It was a First World War army hut, originally on Cannock Chase. And goodness knows what Miss Anstey made of it. Perhaps it was to store stuff for her girls. Isn't it interesting that all the men wore hats and ties while they were working? That's John. John was very keen to show that he was at the, at the heart of everything. He was prepared to work hard, wasn't he? And that's George Matthews, the stage director. Do you think that's Peter English? That is Peter English, yes. Who designed sets and costumes but was prepared to, 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 to work hard throughout the construction.
that's Harold Abraham standing up the top there on the right. And was he one of the actors? Yes, he was one of he was not a founder member, but um, he, he was there in the early days. That's Harold again, passing bricks down. This must have been before the outbreak of war. Oh yes. Apart from the actual bricklaying and alterations, every kind of work has been undertaken, including excavation, carpentry, plumbing, plastering, electrical installation. So hopefully there were some builders in amongst the members who could teach everyone what to do? There was only one um, professional, retired professional builder, Gosh, Jack Billington. He taught them all how to lay bricks. And it's interesting to note that two thirds of all the bricks were laid by two ladies, Joan Cross, Harold Abraham's wife, and Peter English. And the stage house, which is still there, was largely built by these two ladies. So that's what we can see today, still existing? Yes. And the site, I believe, was only 28 feet wide, very, very narrow, which meant that all the scaffolding had to be erected inside the building, which, which in itself was quite a challenge. The wooden hut virtually covered the width of the whole site. It was very narrow. Here we see the water supply being put in. Yes, they did gas fitting. Um, and much of this work, the, the theatre remained for 40 years until the 1980s when a, any further substantial work was done. That's so it, it stood the test of time, didn't it? Yes, it did. When John English started out the project, he had a, a building fund of just £40. £40 in the bank before they undertook any of this work. It's an extraordinarily brave thing yeah. to do. That's Phyllis Jakes, who was the publicity secretary. I think this is a tea break, isn't it? It is a tea break. That's the fastest that you see anyone moving on the film. <laughs> In the background, Dickie, you can see all those roof tiles. And as I understand it, it was some embarrassment to John that he managed to buy 20,000 roof tiles early on and they were stored for, for three years before they were, they were ever used. Yes, and of course, the site was so cramped, they very often had to move the materials more than once. And some materials must have been stored off site. Yeah, John had um, on Sutton Road um, before the war there were large, about six large mansions between the Enton and the Abbey. John rented, I think it was called Colwyn House, a coach house there, and he stored, uh, prior to the theatre being built, loads of materials. Uh, there uh, and um, at other sites. What did they use to transport things to and from those houses to the theatre, Dickey? Before the war, um, John had got a little trailer attached to the back of his car. But of course, when the war came, um, 
that made it difficult because there was no petrol for ordinary people. But I think John got a petrol allocation of, because of his work. He was technical director of Chance Brothers West Bromwich and I know John had got a car so he was probably able to use it to move materials for Highbury. John always found a way to do everything he wanted to do, didn't he? Oh yes. He was a great mover and shaker. Yes, I remember John's old Mark Morris car sitting in the front and looking through holes in the floor. You could see the road. <laughs> Here they're starting to work at some height. Yes. And I believe that the scaffolding at one point was 40 feet high and from it, the from the depths of the excavation all the way up to the eaves. And the scaffolding was all wooden. And inside the building. Yes. Here we see what the men got up to, which was ex excavating 250 tonnes of material from the, from the to, to create the basement. And that's exactly what you can see today. And that's Jack Bishop on the left with the pick. He was the oldest member, one of the original hybrid players from the 1920s. But he, he would tackle anything. So here we are, one year before the outbreak of war. And one, one year's work had resulted in considerable progress. Did you see what was going on as you came past as a young man, as a teenager? I did, did see it because uh, uh, I used to come, the place that is now our coffee shop was a fish and chip shop when I was a little boy. I used to come up for a few pennies of chips. Um, but my grandfather, um, Edwin Bird, he was um, quite impressed. Um, he, he used to walk up Sheffield Road to see his brother who lived on the corner of Yew Tree Road and Sheffield Road. And he, I can remember him coming into our kitchen one day to, to say, I've just been up Sheffield Road and seen ladies in trousers <laughs> laying bricks. And here we've got the, it look, what looks like the Lady Mayoress and possibly the, 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 the Mayor of Sutton laying bricks as well. Yes, that's right. But this was fundraising, wasn't it? This was yes. selling, this was, this was raising money for the that's, theatre. That's Councillor Mayall, the Mayor. Yeah. And his wife. John always had an eye for, for raising money, didn't he? Oh, yes. And so, Councillor Mayall, I think he was one of the patrons amongst many that John put on the Highbury note paper to begin with. This is where the dressing rooms were. John was very keen to have a green room right from the start. Oh, yes. Very important for some. Cause because his productions in the, in the very early years had up to 30 people involved in each production. Oh yes, there were a lot of large casts. That's why I appeared in one or two early plays. Not because I wanted to be, but... The main structure of the stage, dressing rooms and scene dock having been completed, the centre of the wooden auditorium had to be lifted six feet in order to meet the top of the proscenium arch. This was accomplished without a hitch, the structure being raised foot by foot by hydraulic pumps. Here we see one of the hydraulics in action. So they, they jacked it up one brick level at a time and laid a course of bricks and then another brick at a time and laid the next course of bricks which was quite extraordinary. In September 1939, at the outbreak of war, many of the willing helpers had to join HM forces. This somewhat slowed the pace of the building, but the few remaining staunch supporters carried on. By the early 1940, the whole of the shell of the theatre was complete.
that looks like one of the canvas drapes that they used for the blackout. Would that be right, Dickie? Probably. And you say that they had... You they can see drapes there. Oh, yes. Which... And you can see... The Go on. I was going to say, on the... Oh, that's Jack Billington with the Trilby hat. He was the professional builder who taught them all how to lay bricks. And was he an actor? No. So he was backstage? He, 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 he did come to see the plays, but he was, he was responsible really for overseeing all the building. But how did he get involved to that extent? Was he, was he, was he a regular backstage crew? Well, no, because he, he, he must have been, he was an Erdington builder. So uh, John did his usual persuading act? I'm not, I'm not sure who persuaded him to take part. Yeah. But he was an Erdington man, obviously aware of what was going on. But you can see the way he handles a trowel. Yes. Un unlike the hybrid players. You know, he, he was so skilled. No, we owe a great debt and gratitude to Jack Billington. Because all the bricks for the majority of the theatre were second hand. That's why you see um, shots of them cleaning the bricks, except for the facade, which you will see there on the corner. Um, those were nice new decorative bricks, all that frontage you can see there. They were new bricks. But and all the, the, all the rest were second hand. The total cost of all the materials for the whole of the theatre, as I understand it, was, was just £1,000, which is, which, is, which is an amazing feat. Well, lots of the material was um, begged, borrowed or acquired uh, without cost. Now what we're going to see now is a production at Sutton Coalfield Town Hall and John had the energy to organise this and direct this while the building was still going on, is that right? Yes. And there can't have been many people who could have afforded to produce a colour film. Geoffrey Baker had substantial funds at his private disposal, which, which he was very keen to spend on the theatre, wasn't he? Yes. I mean, he um, not only made and financed the film, um, he was responsible for lots of other activities. Um, Particularly Sunday Club? Sunday Club, which he founded at the beginning of the theatre opening in May 1942, which had a series of recitals and talks by very distinguished speakers, um, which were all entirely financed by Geoffrey Baker. And I guess Peter English would have been busy making these costumes well, as well as laying bricks. That's Peter English. There. So she's acting as well. Yes. Goodness me. She was very gifted. Her sister also was an active hybrid member, Agnes Holt. Um, but she was not interested in acting. Um, she did front of house organising the catering and other front of house activities. They must have started to feel that the theatre really was coming together when they were mm. actually mm. constructing the floor. And no thought had been given at this stage to where the seats were going to come from. And no. And thanks to Adolf Hitler, things fell into their lap, is that right? Yes. Um, John, uh, of course, 
um, was in contact um, right from the beginning of the hybrid players with people like Sir Barry Jackson and Derek Salberg of the Alec and also Emil Littler of the Prince of Wales Theatre. And um, So these 110 green plush seats full of shrapnel were brought from the centre of town and cleaned up? Yeah. There's a nice shot of the seats. They were manufactured by Beck and Windybank in Birmingham. Um, they were a theatre and cinema um, seating firm. My wife's grandfather was a Mr Beck and he worked in this family firm. And I believe that the auditorium was just wide enough for ten seats. Yes. And they decided that they couldn't have a five and a five because people would come to the theatre in pairs yes. on the whole. So they had four seats, then an aisle, and then six seats. That's right. Right down the middle. This is where all the lifting gear is for the lighting and the and the, and the scenery. Yeah, on the gantry. And I have a feeling these still exist today. Yes. That's, so what what is up there out of sight today was yeah. built in 1942. Yeah. And has stood the test of time. Yeah, passed the tests. And quite a lot of um, electrical equipment was um, donated by Sir Barry Jackson at the Rep because he was having the repertory theatre in Station Street. Um, all the electrical equipment was being replaced because the theatre there had been built in 1912. So John acquired all the electrical equipment, switchboard and such like, and, and spots from the old Rep. When the toilets were first built, when they were first being used, I think there was some comment that the men's toilets weren't big enough because all the men wanted to leave a hat and a coat in the toilets before they went into the auditorium. The walls of the auditorium have to be plastered, but before this can be done, wall board has to be fixed and the joints cemented. The inside of the auditorium was beautifully decorated. Um, People could, couldn't sort of imagine that on the outside it was just an old wooden hut, but inside it was decorated beautifully. So this is the switchboard that came from the Birmingham Rep, yeah. the old Rep that is, before, yeah. built before the new Rep. And here we see the switchboard. That was my first job. On the lighting? I was the lowest form of life in the lighting department. <laughs> Were you being told what to do? Oh yes. And there wasn't a box like there is now? You were, where, where were you located when you were doing the lighting? Um, where the left hand side of the proscenium arch, yes. it was just a few a couple of feet behind that. 
a little platform. So you had to climb up and, and balance precariously above the stage. Uh, uh, this is the f one of the first audiences, I guess, coming out of the theatre in 1942. Yes. Everyone wearing hats, of course. Well, the man with his back to us was a Midland bank manager, Mr. Clare, whose daughter was a member of Highbury. And I guess very few people arriving in motor cars. Uh, at that stage, none. But some people arriving in horses. If people came on horseback, and you'll see a pony and trap in a moment. There's the trap. And of course all the hybrid players rode bicycles or went up the road and got on the train or a bit further up the road and got on the tram. And a lovely shot along Sheffield Road showing complete lack of any cars of any kind. So there must have been many horses tied up at the back of the theatre? Oh quite a few on some occasion. In the in the garden. There, there was a, they had the stables, but it would only seat one or two horses. And here's the front of house ladies. Yes, Molly Randall and Linda Jeans. Molly, who later became John English's second wife. That's right. And who helped found the, the Mac at Cannon Hill. We're now going to see some pictures of John and Peter at home. This is a very period piece of, of film. I would love to have seen this in colour. Was John's father, Bertie English, alive at this time? Um, I, I don't know. Because it was, it was Bertie English's house, Highbury, that gave its name to Highbury Players, did it not? Yes, in Wild Green. Because that's where the original Independent Labour Party play reading group met that became the Highbury Players. That's right. In 1923, am I right? Um, or was it 1924? Well, no, the, the hybrid players were formed in 1924, um, but they, they started the play reading in the early 1920s. This is Le Bourgeois Gentillon. And this is using the Revolve? This is using the Revolve for the first time, and I was actually in this play with Bernard Summerfield. We were a pair of flunkies, we, we were either side of these doors. So will, will you appear on screen, Dickie? Not on this, because this was filmed on a separate occasion. It was not a performance. Especially for Geoffrey Baker's film. It was just, this bit was filmed for Geoffrey's film. I, I, I don't know where I was. I was probably... Um, hmm. Probably at work. Yes, uh, I, I would think so, probably. Margaret Platt on the left. Peter English on the right. And am I right in thinking that the revolve was turned by someone underneath the stage? With ropes. With ropes. <laughs> it was the first, first revolve we made. Actually, it worked remarkably well. <laughs> Somebody was a bit swift on the curtains. <laughs> Mr. Geoffrey Baker wishes to express his gratitude for the kindness and hospitality of Mr. and Mrs. John English and the entire company of the Highbury players during the making of this film. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the end. Is it time for a cup of coffee or tea? Absolutely, yes.